Halfland, an ahistorical prehistory. Part 15. The Magpie and the Mercenary. In the 131st year of the Common Reckoning, Asta, the queen of the dwarves of the Dark Hills, unexpectedly died. She was 40 years old. Asta had been a powerful, popular and effective ruler. She had brought peace and prosperity to the dwarvish lands, from Unna's Crag to the Hillhold, and eastward, across the Dark Hills, even to the lands on the far bank of the River Ravenshead. But she was unmarried and childless, and had named no heir, and there was no obvious candidate to replace her. There was a dwarvish noblewoman named Halberta, who could trace her ancestry back to Bodolf. Halberta was therefore a personage of influence. Her own children had all died young, but she did have two grandsons, the children of her daughter, Halfred. Furthering the fortunes of these grandchildren had become her sole object in life. The father of her grandchildren was Halfred's widower, a dwarf named Ulfgrim. Under Halberta's patronage, Ulfgrim had risen to a position of power and prestige at Asta's court. And now Halberta determined to make him king, and thus make her grandchildren the heirs to the throne. The leading dwarf in the kingdom was Asta's mother, Irsa. At this point, she was old and infirm, but still respected and influential. Halberta pressed Irsa to support Ulfgrim's bid for the throne. Irsa reluctantly agreed to this, observing that, when the eagles are all dead, I suppose a magpie must rule. Irsa's support tipped the balance, and Ulfgrim was crowned at the hillhold as king of the dwarves of the Dark Hills. The ancestral homeland of the dwarves was in the north, in the hills surrounding the mountain known as the Old Mother. These lands had no king, but were governed by the Council of Guildsmen and the Mine Lord. Each trade had its guild. The Council of Guildsmen, which was based in Southvale, regulated competition between these various guilds, each of which acted as a cartel. This regulation was enforced by spear dwarves, hired, when necessary, by the council. However, the only permanent employer and therefore potential provider of spear dwarves in this region was the mine lord, based in Delvings, who owned the mine workings around Silvermere. In practice, then, the council's power relied on the mine lord, and in return, the council made sure that in any dispute, the mine lord's commercial interests were protected. However, in recent years, this cosy business model had come under threat. The Dark Hills were far distant from the Council of Guildsmen and outside its jurisdiction. The mines in those hills were owned by the Crown and used convict labour to extract and process ore producing metal at a lower cost than the Silvermere mines. Further, the craftsmen of the Dark Hills were not constrained by the guild system and could ignore the Council of Guildsmen's stipulations regarding quality control and pricing. The result was that the workshops of the Dark Hills were turning out goods at lower prices than those around Silvermere, Delvings and Southvale. Now, you shouldn't think that the artisans of the Dark Hills were producing cheap and shoddy workmanship. Far from it. While a member of one of the guilds might have sneered at some of their finish and detailing, it was still dwarvish work, and so created with an obsessive care and attention to detail. As far as the halflings were concerned, these were still high-quality products, for which the halflings would pay a premium. The merchants of the Geitzmark and Unnuscrag purchased wagon loads of goods from the Dark Hills, 
and sold them to the halflings at high prices. But in Delvings and South Vale, the warehouses were full of goods that could not be sold. The mine lord at this time was a dwarf named Bardi, who had inherited the Silvermere mines from his mother, Alphide, who had died four years previously. Alphide had been the third of three successive female mine ladies. Dwarves are somewhat superstitious, and when Alphide had bequeathed the mines to Bardi, a male dwarf, rather than to another mine lady, they muttered into their beards that no good would come of a male mine lord. The continuing decline in the profits of the Silvermere mines seemed to vindicate these prophecies. Bardi did not agree. His analysis was that the best way to revive his fortunes was not to replace him with a female, but to prevent the mines in the Dark Hills from undercutting those around Silvermere. And the best way to achieve this was to take control of the mines in the Dark Hills. And the best way to do this was to become the King of the Dwarves of the Dark Hills. Now, you may think that Bardi was being somewhat overambitious in thus aiming for a throne, but he was married to Ingeldrefa, who was the daughter of Berra, who was the youngest daughter of Body, who had, in his time, been Earl of Unascrag and the King of the Dwarves of the Dark Hills. As far as Bardi was concerned, this gave him as strong a claim to the throne of the Dark Hills as anyone else. When he heard the news of Aster's death, he informed his brother Harrock that he was going away for a time, and asked Harrock to supervise the mine workings in his absence. He then slipped away, accompanied only by Ingeldrefa, his infant son Bardolf, and a few trusty retainers. Bardi headed south, skirting round centres of population and avoiding attention. Until, that is, he reached Unascrag, where he raised the banner of the House of Body, and proclaimed that he and Ingeldrefa had come to liberate the populace from the yoke of the hillhold. He obtained the response that he had desired. The dwarves of Unascrag had always resented being subject to the hillhold, and were fiercely loyal to the descendants of Body. Ingeldrefa and her husband were welcomed with much rejoicing and proclaimed as the Lady and Earl of Unascrag. It seemed that Bardi now had a secure base from which to raise an army that would be capable of taking the Dark Hills by force. However, he found this more difficult than expected. The dwarves of Unascrag were delighted to have their independence back but it seemed that they had little desire to participate in a war of conquest. Even so, Ulfgrim had lost control of Unascrag, and then he had more bad news. The tax collectors he had sent to the lands beyond the river Ravenshead returned, empty-handed. This was frontier territory, and the inhabitants tended to be self-reliant and contemptuous, of authority. Asta had won their respect, but Ulfgrim had not, and so they refused to pay taxes to him. They felt that, at least for the moment, they could manage very well without a king. Harney, the king of the Geitzmark, watched these developments with interest. It seemed that Ulfgrim's kingdom was falling apart, and Harney reasoned that he might as well pick up some of the more valuable pieces. He started to raise an army, intending to occupy the heart of the Dark Hills and take control of the mines. Although Harney tried to conceal his intentions, mustering his forces took time, and news of his activities inevitably spread. Ulfgrim's response to these tidings was to gather in stores and prepare for a siege. The road from Geitzbin to the Dark Hills ran past the gates of the Hillhold. If Harney marched into the Dark Hills without first capturing the Hillhold, 
then his lines of supply would be vulnerable. But taking the hill hold by force would be difficult. Ulfgrim reasoned that all he had to do was sit tight until Harney's army ran out of provisions or enthusiasm and went home. Bardi was dismayed to hear of Harney's preparations for war. Should Harney take control of the mines in the Dark Hills, he would have every incentive to continue their current model of operation. And, under his strong and stable government, the efficiency of those operations might be further increased. This could only be to the financial detriment of the mine lord. Bardi was pondering how best to change his plans when Odo Eertuft arrived in Unascrag. Odo was a halfling. His brother had been mayor of Elmgrove, and Odo had distinguished himself in the ultimately unsuccessful defence of that town against the Skeldings. Following that defeat, large numbers of halflings had been displaced from Elmgrove and the surrounding regions. Many of those refugees admired Odo and looked to him for leadership. Odo wanted to retaliate against the Skeldings and recapture the territory that had been lost. After all, it was his homeland. But the halflings of Muffins and Hamfistum, where many of the refugees had fled, were not supportive of this idea. Provisioning and equipping an army would be expensive. As they saw it, any attack against the Skeldings would most likely fail and provoke Skelding retaliation. And why would anyone want to recapture lands that at any time might be pillaged by psychotic bands of murderous women descending from the mountains? It was surely better to leave the Skeldings to deal with that problem. Odo Eertuft therefore sought assistance from further afield. This is why he turned up at Unascrag, and Bardi saw an opportunity. He proposed that Odo raise an army of halflings. If this army fought in Bardi's cause, well, Bardi was the mine lord. His business may have been in decline, but he was still the richest dwarf in Halfland. He would reward Odo well, and Odo could then use this gold to finance his army in a fight against the Skeldings. The halflings had no great trust of dwarves. They still resented the actions of Orm, and they recalled the battles they had fought against the house of Hogney. Bardi's wife was of that house, but Odo had nowhere else to turn. He accepted Bardi's proposal. Bardi then sent a letter to Ulfgrim, this letter offered Ulfgrim military assistance in his fight against Harney, on two conditions. The first condition was that Ulfgrim recognised the independent sovereignty of Unascrag. This condition was included to please Ingoldrifa. The second condition was that Ulfgrim granted a charter to Bardi, granting him and his heirs complete control of the mines in the Dark Hills in exchange for an annual fee to be paid to the Crown. Ulfgrim accepted these terms. He liked being king. He could have nice things, and everyone did as he told them. But he found the day-to-day -day business of governing rather tiresome. He welcomed the opportunity to offload responsibility for operating the mines onto someone else while still receiving an income from them. And what did he care about Unna's crag? It was a long way from the hillhold. He just wanted to get this seemingly inevitable war over and done with. In the spring of the 132nd year of the Common Reckoning, Harney marched on the hillhold and besieged it. A week later, Bardi arrived with a small number of dwarves and a larger number of halflings. A battle was fought, in which Ulfgrim won unexpected glory, and Harney lost his life. 
Harney's army marched back to Geitzbin. Ulfgrim consolidated his position as King of the Dark Hills. Ingeldrifa became the sovereign lady of Unuscrag, and Bardi gained control of the mines in the Dark Hills. Harney was succeeded as King of the Geitzmark by his son, Halfred, who was a young dwarf of 17 summers. There was no serious challenge to his rule, but nonetheless, he spent the early years of his reign focused on matters within his borders, rather than on military adventures beyond them. Ulfgrim had no desire to fight more battles. Neither did Bardi. His time was filled with business, travelling between Silvermere, the Dark Hills and Unna's Crag, where his wife, Ingeldrifa, now ruled, adored by the people. It is true that they did smile at the large painting she had commissioned, showing her in battered, blood-stained armour, triumphant on the battlefield. The truth was that during the battle she had stayed out of harm's way in the rear ranks, but she had been there and her people respected her for that. And she was charitable, generous and rich, and when she was not distributing largesse, she largely left them to their own devices. And so it was that the power vacuum left by the death of Asta was filled, and, for a while at least, peace was restored between the squabbling principalities of the dwarves. But Odo Eartuft did not desire peace. He desired to make war upon the Skeldings. Bardi made good his promise to pay Odo well. Odo took Bardi's gold and marched his army through the halfling towns of Hamfistum and Muffins, where he gave speeches, calling the people to his cause. Who are these Skeldings? he would ask his audience. Nothing but common pirates, stealing land to which they have no claim. We halflings have lived in Halfland for years beyond measure, long before any jumped-up skelding interloper set foot on its shores. The land belongs to us. What claim do the skeldings have to overwater or elm grove, built by halfling hands? What claim to farmland cleared by halfling labour for halfling use? They have no just claim. All that they have, they have stolen from us, yes, and murdered thousands of our people in stealing it. There is no end to their rapacity and violence. Enough is enough. There will be no peace for the halflings while any skelding lives on our shores. Let us drive them back into the sea from whence they came. One might debate whether this rhetoric provided an altogether fair and balanced view of history. But large numbers of halflings, particularly those who had been recently dispossessed by the Skeldings, wholeheartedly agreed with the sentiments expressed and swelled Odo's ranks. The halflings marched across the Skelding frontier, driving the Skeldings from the land with fire and sword. Anything that the Skeldings had built, the halflings burned. Any Skeldings they encountered, the halflings mercilessly slew, regardless of age, sex or infirmity. The Skelding settlers fled and the halflings marched unopposed into Elmgrove. There was a Skelding lord by the name of Eldred. He had fought at the Battle of Bedstraw Common, where many of his companions had fallen. He had found favour with King Gunlaf, and been rewarded with large estates. As far as he was concerned, he had won that land justly, by the strength of his sword arm and he was not prepared to lightly surrender it. As the larger part of the Skelding population streamed in a disorganised rabble toward Great Hall, with the rampaging halfling army in pursuit, Eldred gathered to him those Skeldings 
who were willing to fight. He made his stand at Vetchfield Farm, where a great battle was fought. The halflings were hard pressed, but ultimately Eldred was slain, and the Skeldings fled from the field. Odo was victorious. The road to Great Hall lay open to him.